Welcome to the Rising Laterally podcast. Each episode, you will learn something fascinating so you can bring big ideas to your small talk. Your growth is our growth. Listening to these episodes, subscribing to our weekly newsletter, engaging our posts on social media, and sharing our show with your friends and family is deeply appreciated as we work hard to expand this platform. You can also visit our page at buymeacoffee.com to contribute what you think the show is worth. To the folks who are taking this step, we can't thank you enough. Look for the link in our show notes for more details about how you can support and follow us. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Double Nickel episode, number 55. And this is going to be a great one. We are joined by Andy Norman, the author of the new book published by HarperCollins called Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and the Search for a Better Way to Think. Andy directs the Humanism Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University, is the founder of the Cognitive Immunology Research Collaborative, and has done research on the evolutionary origins of human reasoning and the norms that make dialogue fruitful. He wants to help people develop immunity to bad ideas. So he looks to clarify the foundations of responsible thinking about what actually matters. He writes for magazines, and he helps organizations develop next level critical thinkers. Think about it for yourself. You know deep down that our society, our future is hanging in the balance. And we need to have this important conversation right now and talk about how irrational ideas, especially in our internet connected era, are creating a serious imbalance as they take hold of people. We are at a fork in the road of the story of humans. One way is that we keep going the way we're going and we keep clinging to our conveniently comfortable beliefs and our group thinking. Or we take a serious look at our mental immune health, how ideas are being shared, how we can each think about better ways to think and collectively we can create a whole new enlightenment. We're gonna try to do what we can through this conversation and our time together right now to potentially change the course of our history. Andy, welcome to the podcast and thank you for swinging by. Arjun, it's a pleasure to be here. That was an amazing introduction, man. I get, can I get you to do all my, my publicity for me? Cause uh, I'm loving the way you, you uh, present the ideas. <laughs> you know, you have my personal email so we can talk about it offline. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's a pleasure to be here, guys, both of you. Yeah, and it's an honor to actually have this chance to be talking about science and human behavior with you and human values with you. Uh, your book was awesome. It was really dense. It was filled with really interesting thought experiments and fascinating ways to actually rephrase things in normal everyday conversation. So that was really, um, you know, one thing that I got from your book, it really changed me, there was a lot of shifts in perspective. And there's so much to talk about, I could have picked from anywhere in the book to start. But I'm actually going to use a quote that you opened up chapter 12 with, and then let's see where this goes. You dropped an Einstein quote, the quote goes, the most important thing is to never stop questioning. Mm. So this yeah, so this book is published as the new president was being sworn in. The first round of vaccines were being rolled out. You've been running the inquiry-based community at Carnegie Mellon for a number of years, and you've been spent, you know, spending a lot of your time researching. But when do you think you first started questioning things? And how do you think that that was taking shape for you? Was it something that you were doing as a kid? Was it something that you developed in college? And how has the approach of questioning changed your life? Wow. Um... Yeah, so uh, I showed up at college pretty convinced I was going to be a physics major <laughs> and then took a, a philosophy of science course. And this was a course that basically made me ask all kinds of questions that nobody had exposed me to in high school. This is as a college freshman. And it just kind of blew me away that you could actually think hard about the methods of science and start to see ways in which we can improve science, for example, and improve the way we think and, and reason about the world. Um, so I was sitting around kind of belly aching with my, my roommate, you know, one of those late all night dorm session, bowl sessions, right? And I just oh, said, yeah. <laughs> man, our, our species is, has a sorry lack of wisdom. I, I really hope we, uh, you know, get wise before we destroy our planet. And my roommate said, well, quit complaining, Andy. Why don't you do something about it? <laughs> so, 
And so I declared as a philosophy major within the month and uh, it's kind of never looked back. I've been trying to figure out how we can all become better and wiser versions of ourselves. And it's led me to this idea that our minds have immune systems and we need to learn how to strengthen them because otherwise they can malfunction and in the worst case scenario, turn us into, I don't know, QAnon conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting because one other thing that you pull from the book as a follow up to that is the idea that when we fail or that we fail when we don't ask basic questions mm -hmm. and question our self-serving beliefs. So with that, I mean, as I was reading your book, I just felt like, OK, there's a lot of really good stuff here. But is it too late? Is it too little too late? Like who's actually going to really you know, question their basic beliefs and, and question what, what's being recommended to them. Cause most of the things that they're seeing is being recommended to them, whether it's through YouTube or through Spotify, like the algorithms yeah. are recommending things to people. So I guess the follow up to that is, you know, who's really going to take the time in this day and age to really question their beliefs. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, as my book was headed down the kind of the home stretch towards publication, uh, a friend emailed me and said, hey, Andy, hurry up and get that book out there before the world falls apart. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, look, I, I don't want to congratulate myself that my book has all the answers to our world's problems. But, but look, I think it's pretty obvious to everybody who's paying attention today that political partisanship is through the roof, that there's all kinds of people are, are occupying these strange worlds that they construct for themselves based on what they find online. And our worlds are drifting apart to the point where we really have trouble dialoguing in a fruitful way with one another. Right. Um, now, this that kind of problem has happened again and again through human history. And it usually happens because people get dogmatic and just attached to their beliefs rather than ask the deep questions that loosen up those beliefs and get them to kind of keep an open mind towards other points of view. So you can actually see ways in which both political, religious ideologies have really hardened in recent years. And it's very much an open question whether people will loosen those up and come together in a way that will allow our country, for example, to persist. Um, I think we need to address the problem at a very fundamental level. It might, might have to involve a redesign of social media platforms, for example, to nudge us all in the right direction. There's some really interesting work being done on, on that front. But I think the number one thing we can all do right out of the gates is understand that ideas can act, bad ideas can spread like viruses, like parasites. And our minds can become infected. And once you, I mean, every one of us can see other people whose minds are infected with bad ideas. And yet it almost never occurs to us that our own minds might be infected with bad ideas. Hilarious. But we have to turn that lens on ourselves and ask ourselves, gee, how do I spot and remove the bad ideas that have snuck past my mind's defenses? And furthermore, how can I strengthen my mind's defenses so that my thinking doesn't become unhinged and I become you know, a force for, for evil in the world? Yeah, and I think the natural question a lot of people might have would be, how do we distinguish between what kinds of ideas are good and what kinds of ideas are bad? I think that's the natural question that I had going into the book and you cover it to a pretty wide extent. I'm just wondering if you could share with our audience yeah. what basic filters we can run in our ideas to kind of bucket them into either good, rational, or bad, irrational. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, Jay. The, the key fundamental question at the very heart of all of this is, you know, what is a bad idea? How do, you, how do you know if an idea is really a good one or a bad one? So there's some very simple truths that we just need to remind ourselves to answer this question. Number one, we all recognize the truth is a good quality in an idea. Falsehood is a bad quality. Um, being well evidenced is a good quality. Being poorly evidenced is a bad quality. Um, if an idea is useful, if it benefits humanity, if it improves our well being, that certainly counts for an idea. And if it harms people, that certainly counts against the idea. Now, and here's the thing to see we've gotten into a frame of mind where 
we assume that the goodness or badness of ideas is merely a subjective matter of opinion. And when we adopt that attitude, we stop inquiring into what's really right or really wrong, what's really good and what's really bad, because mm -hmm. it's all relative. It's all just a matter of perspective. Why bother debating whether immigration policy should be changed? You have your opinion, I have mine, and it's all relative. Now, no responsible thinker, no responsible philosopher will buy that kind of relativistic nonsense because they know it just cuts productive dialogue short. So the thing to do is replace the idea that goodness and badness is merely of an idea is merely subjective with the idea that ideas really do have properties, logical and causal. Mm. And we can study those properties and in a careful, fair-minded way, tally them up on the, the pros on the one side and the cons on the other and set aside the ideas that aren't serving us well. Um, we can't keep saying, we can't keep kicking the can down the road by asking ourselves the rhetorical question, who's to say which ideas are good and which ideas are bad? If we yeah. do that, we end up letting the meme pool just um, fill up with nonsense yeah. and people's thinking starts to go haywire. Yeah, who's to say is one phrase in the book. The other one is it's all relative. Like those are two phrases that came out in the book where it's like, you know, if somebody says that to you, you actually have a responsibility to kind of talk about the fact that we all have to kind of put our BS meter up a little bit and kind of figure out like, where is the nonsense coming from? It's on us to do that. So that's next right. time someone says like, who's to say, or it's all relative, I think that's a lazy way of trying to skirt an answer. Um, and yeah. the polite way to reply to that question is just to say, Aren't we to say, isn't it up to us to spot the mm. bad ideas? And isn't it us to, up to us to remove the bad ones? Mm. Nobody's going to do it for us, right? That there's no, mm. there's no deity out there that's going to sweep down and, and, and uh, sweep away all the bad ideas for us. I, I believe that we have to take responsibility and do that ourselves. As you say, a real yeah. pro weighs all the cons. Ah, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and there, and, oh, go ahead, Andy. No, go ahead. Well, just um, to to highlight the the point Arjun just uh, just came up with, we all have beliefs, we things we want to believe, and other things we don't want to have to accept. And when you have the idea that as long as you have a few reasons on your side that that's enough, then you can pretty much rationalize anything. And the antidote to that mm -hmm. is to throw out the idea that if I have a good reason for something, then I'm being reasonable. And say, you know what? It's not enough to have one or two reasons that count in your favor. You have to look at the cons as well as the pros. And you have to consider the arguments on the other side. And if you don't make a mental habit of looking at it as considering the cons as well as the pros, you're just plain not being a responsible thinker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where confirmation bias comes in. As you said, we're sort of starting to live in two different worlds and one world promotes all the pros of that side and all the cons of the others and the other world promotes all the pros of their side and all the cons of the other. So I think the middle ground is to be found in recognizing uh, the strengths from the opposite side and the weaknesses in whatever camp we may find ourselves in. Yeah. And, and when, when a culture war breaks out and everybody feels endangered or embattled, they cling more tightly to the reasons that make their side look good and they tend to brush the ideas or the reasons that make their side look shaky, their positions look shaky under the rug. And you get positions hardening on both sides because both sides feel they just have to man the barricades uh, for their view. But truly fair-minded thinkers don't allow themselves to get fall, to fall into that trap. I think, I mean, one of my big claims in the book is that culture wars actually compromise our mind's immune systems mental immune systems start to break down and act in crazy, crazy ways when ordinary dialogue gets replaced with political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And can you give us a uh, kind of potted explanation of how the mental immune system we all are endowed with functions in your, in your model? Sure. So, so we all know that our bodies have immune systems and their job is to spot infectious microbes and either prevent them from taking root in the body or, or to remove them from the body. 
Well, it turns out, based on about 60 years of research, and this is a, a well-kept secret, that our minds actually have systems for spotting and removing infectious ideas. Um, going way back in evolutionary history, the wrong idea could get you killed. Mm. So our minds actually had to develop the ability to spot the most harmful or the most self-destructive ideas, right? Think about, um, you know, imagine somebody suggesting that you stick your hand into a fire and grab one of the coals. You know, you run a little simulation in your mind and say, uh, no, not a good idea, right? That's, right? That's your mind's immune system, basically trying to figure out whether the suggestion is a good one. Mm. And each of us has, has this capacity to kind of run simulations on an idea and try to spot its good qualities and bad qualities. The problem is that those systems can become highly biased and uh, self-serving or that when they get harnessed to serve the, the cause of wishful thinking, then we start to be dishonest to ourselves and we lose the ability to even spot the truly bad ideas. One visual that might help people um, if they really want to go through this exercise, it takes a lot of practice, but just imagine that in your brain, there are idea bouncers. So there are people like, just like you have a bouncer at a club who's going to screen who can get in and get out. Just imagine that there's a bouncer in your brain or two bouncers in your brain that with each idea, they're either tossing that idea out of the club or they're they're keeping that idea in the club like they allow it so i don't know it's kind of weird but for the last week or so i've literally been walking around and like i have mind bouncers in my brain that are <laughs> analyzing ideas and either tossing them out of the club or they're keeping them and as ridiculous as that sounds it's how i'm practicing how to like unlearn things which i think mm -hmm. is a huge problem for people so how would you help someone begin to unlearn the things that they've been taught? Because that might be like the first step here for, un for people to start becoming more like persuadable. Yeah, that it's relatively easy to, to shoot down a bad idea that is new to you and harder to let go of a bad idea that you've become part of, that, that you've allowed to, that has taken roots as, as a, as in a belief in your mind, because then it starts to feel like it's, it's part of you, right? Mm -hmm. And so you respond defensively to the questions or the challenges that might uproot it. Um, you mentioned the bouncers. That, that's one of the metaphors I, I channel in the book. It's yeah. not mine originally. Um, but the, the, body's bounce, the body's immune systems bouncers are called antibodies, right? They course through your, your body and they swarm around harmful microbes and they literally consume them. The mind's antibodies are questions or, or more precisely doubts. So when an idea comes along that has um, defects or downsides, a lot of times you might notice the good qualities of that idea first. They might occupy the foreground. Right. But if, but sometimes there's a little voice in the back of your head that says, eh, something's not quite right here, or this doesn't quite make sense, or, you know, that looks like a pretty exciting idea, but what if this happens? You have to learn to listen to that little voice, the, the naysayer, the doubter in the back of your mind, because a lot, because those, they're, they're your mind's antibodies, and they're trying to bring problematic features of the idea to your attention. If you learn to listen to that little voice, you'll start to become better at spotting bad ideas and, and your mind's immune systems or it's, it's a system for bouncing troublemakers, cognitive troublemakers will become better functioning. Mm. So, so I think one thing we can all do is uh, none of us likes to feel doubtful or uncertain. It's an uncomfortable feeling, but you can actually learn to grow, become more comfortable with it. Um, some of the best philosophers of the 20th century have argued basically that philosophy's primary virtue is it helps you become more uncomfortable, more comfortable with uncertainty. Mm. And when you do, you're less likely to respond angrily or um, in a dogmatic way or in a closed minded way to information that challenges your worldview.
just real quick, since we're on this, right, we're talking about specific language that can be used. Well, I'm going to just pull from your book, you know, consider using this next time somebody challenges a, a claim that you're making, or you want to challenge a claim that's being made Just say like, look, I'm not comfortable with that claim. I think it might be a mistake to rely on it. Can you show me that it's worth accepting? Like if somebody tells you that the earth is flat, just be like, look, I'm not comfortable with that claim. I think it's a mistake if we rely on it, but can you, can you show me that it's worth accepting? And that type of language, you know, if we start to incorporate that, we're just going to have much better caring conversations with each other. Part of a lot of it, I think the first step might be to sort of fight down the urge to become defensive. So yeah. Um, some people tend to assume that somebody has to get aggressive first and then you get defensive. But a lot of times what happens is somebody gets defensive first, the other person picks up on the defensiveness and starts to feel disrespected in some fashion. So when, when a student, say, raises a question that challenges my own worldview, I always remind myself, hey, a challenge is an opportunity, not a threat. Mm, Calm a down. Line you know, calm down. I might learn from this, right? So for, for 10 years, when I first started teaching, I put my, my core philosophical convictions on the line every single day. And I let my students um, uh, refine them, shoot them down, um, uh, show me why they were, were less than ideal. And almost daily, I had to change my, my core philosophical <laughs> convictions. And I originally thought that, that might be kind of a scary thing or that it might leave me rootless or flapping in the wind. What I found is that it left me more grounded than ever before. When I learned that it's okay to rethink your core convictions. And, and when you do, it's not like you're suddenly in free fall. What happens is you realize a view that you've long held isn't quite right. It's got some truth to it in all likelihood, but you really have to frame it more carefully if you want to hang on to it. And by the time you're done reframing it, sometimes it's a different idea mm -hmm. and you've let go of the, of the earlier one. But the, but the fall the, from the original idea to the new version is often quite modest and it almost never harms you. It, it almost always represents a, a growth rather than a defeat. And if you, you, so you can't think of, of um, losing an argument as a loss. Losing an argument is a win because you've, you've, you've grown. You've become a wiser version of yourself. Next time somebody defeats you in argument, thank them for, for enlightening you. Um, but try not to let it ever, ever reach the point where it feels like a win-lose, right? Try to right. keep it a all conversations should be conducted in a win-win spirit. If you keep that in mind, you can de-escalate our culture war, get back to thinking clearly and rationally and, and problem solving in the way that America has always done in the past. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was going to use that exact expression, thinking of it in, as in terms of a win-win instead of a win-lose. I think we're not at a point right now where many people are operating from a place of humility. I think of even myself and conversations I've gotten into my uh, family with, you know, or friends with heated conversations over the last year. And, um, you know, the spirit of the conversation hasn't been, let's each put our evidence on the table and figure out how we can arrive at a better truth collectively. It's frankly been, you know, some of these conversations have been one of us trying to get the the one up on the other and that never works even you know it never works at the societal level and it never works at the interpersonal level you really don't want to uh, especially when you're talking with people you care about you don't want to win an argument you know you want to come to a better understanding together it's just healthier for the relationship i think yeah and a, and a really good rule of thumb on that is when somebody expresses a view that's different from yours and that just seems wrong just instead of instead of objecting just ask for clarification, mm. just just say, tell me more about that. Um, get, can you help me understand uh, why that's true? Can you help me understand why you believe that? Because you know, if you're right, or if you have a piece of the truth here that I'm overlooking, you know, I'd I'd like to understand that better. One of my philosophical heroes, Socrates, would wander around, you know, strike up conversations about deep philosophical questions. This is an ancient Greek guy, right, going back thousands of years. But he'd basically say, oh, so that's what you think justice is? Um, I'd love to learn more about justice. Tell me more. 
explain explain mm. your view. And by the time people had explained their ideas fully, a lot of times they could see for themselves that they weren't quite right. Mm. So rather than, approach. in fact, if you can delay the moment where you're raising objections, almost inevitably, just keep asking clarifying questions until people can kind of see for themselves, oh, wait a second, this doesn't quite add up. That's the way to talk to a loved one, right? Like imagine, imagine a girlfriend or a, or a spouse or a, or a boyfriend who, who you disagree with. You, it's really important that you maintain a good, healthy relationship, right? So you don't argue to win. You argue, you, you reason together to find out. Absolutely. It requires a certain amount of humility. That's for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And, and if you just keep reminding yourself the world is way more complicated than I imagine. Than I than my my puny brain can only model the world in, in a with by hugely oversimplifying it. Therefore, chances are very good that this other person I'm talking to sees aspects of that world that I don't, or sees a piece of the truth that I don't have yet. That's that that helps to me remember to bring humility. So I don't, I don't always succeed at being humble in a conversation, but I do make a habit of, of I, I do try. A lot of this is going to take a lot of practice. Um, you mentioned reason to find out. And in your book, you also mentioned a historian by the name of Rutger, Rutger Bregman, who talked about <clears throat> the swapping of reasons is actually a human superpower. So if we can just talk about reasons a little bit more, that might be useful here. So can you talk about like what a reason actually is, you know, why are they even there? Like what, role do they play in society and in a conversation? Yeah, this is one of the aspects of my book that I'm really proud of, because I think I'm kind of pushing the boundaries of, of uh, philo philosophical work on, on, in logic when I hmm. say, hey, let's think really hard about what a reason is. So traditionally, a philosopher, philosophers have said, well, a reason is, is a sentence you used in support of another sentence, or a claim that you use in support of another claim. Um, the, but the point is, the fact is we use reasons against as well as reasons for. We use reasons to delegitimate claims as well as to prop them up. True. So it turns out the reasons are like things we say or write down to try to change other people's minds. We use them as like levers. To, uh, imagine a lever with one end out in the world of, of uh, scribbles and and vocalizations and the other end in your mind. And when you press one end of the lever down, you change somebody's mind. That's the way a reason is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the, the lever often encounters something that doesn't want to, doesn't want to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then what, and then what happens, right? Um, and if you make a habit of hanging on to the beliefs you have, then you end up d breaking the lever. You end up destroying mm -hmm. the mechanism that allows you to continue learning. And so I, I argue in the book that we all need to renew our commitment to yielding to better reasons, that better reasons have the power to illuminate and educate and, and reconcile us, but you have to bring an open mind and a hum humility and a willingness to yield to them. And when you have somebody like a Donald Trump who basically says, to heck with your better reasons, I'm just going to assert the opposite because I can and simply defy reasons. That damages the norm at the very heart of civilization, I argue, yeah. deeply damages a norm that keeps us together and keeps us functioning well. I actually show in the book that this, this norm isn't just useful for keeping dialogue constructive and helping us reconcile our differences. It's also at the heart of science. It's the heart of problem solving. So it's, it's at the heart of um, uh, uh, procedural justice. If reasons can't change minds, none of that stuff works. Yeah. And, and societies start to break down. We have to get back to respecting one another's reasons and learning from them because it's the only way we heal our world. Mm -hmm. Can you think of another point in history where we were at such an inflection point where people's levers were kind of broken on a mass scale and human humans were able to break past that and move back into a period where reason was dominant? 
Yes, and I'm actually, and I love the question because it allows me to inject a, a, a little bit of hope into, into this conversation, right? <laughs> it can, our situation can seem really dire, but our species has experienced periods. There've been many times in history when people's thinking has gone haywire because their mental immune systems have been compromised by the wrong ideas. And a very clear example in my mind is the dark ages. So in the dark ages, religious dogma came to dominate Europe and science basically went on hiatus for a thousand years. The universities were all closed by religious authorities. Um, free inquiry became something that could get you burned at the stake, questioning heretical, you know, questioning orthodoxies could get you burned at the stake. When these kinds of things became um, the norm in Europe, science basically died. I mean, it, it kind of just went into hiding for a long, long time. But then we had this uh, thing called the, the Enlightenment, where the spirit of inquiry sputtered back to life and people started actually listening and learning from one another's reasons again. The reason for this, I argue in the book, is that when dogmatic faith became a, a huge problem in like the 15th, 16th century, there was over a hundred years of religious warfare, Catholics slaughtering Protestants, Protestants slaughtering Catholics. And at the end of that time, Europeans were so fed up with faith they said, to heck with this, let's try reason. Mm. Faith ain't working for us. Mm. Let's get back to actually dialoguing and, and reasoning together about the world. Science was invented by Galileo. Science um, became a thing during that time. Democracies became a thing during, during the Enlightenment. Uh, the idea that uh, political power is only legitimate based on the consent of the governed the idea of human rights, all of these are, are the offshoots of this spirit of inquiry and reasoning that, that um, helped turn Western civilization around. It, we, so we, we've done it in, in the past. I think we can do it again, but it will require a new, a new commitment to this norm that I call reasons fulcrum, the idea that we all need to yield mm -hmm. to better reasons. Yeah. Which could spark more curiosity. Hopefully blood... blood Certainly spark more curiosity. Hopefully blood won't have to be shed uh, to get to that point. Let our ideas die in our stead, right? Right. Let's not, let's not go to war and put our lives on the line. Let's our, let our ideas um, conflict in a, in a constructive way. It, the thing is, conflict doesn't have to be bad. There are, there are constructive ways to wage conflict. Gandhi taught me this. Right? Gandhi taught many of us this. And, and conflict can be growth comes from conflict. We need to be able to have ideas clash in a constructive way. And um, so let's not shy away from the difficult questions. Let's engage each other with open minds and open hearts and actually listen to one another again. It feels like everybody's talking these days, nobody's listening. The art of listening, I think, is the key to almost all of this. We all need to become humble and ready to listen and learn from one another. We can transform our world, make it 10 times more beautiful, but we've got to get back to listening and learning and reasoning collaboratively instead of trying to prosecute our culture warrior attitudes. Yeah, instead of trying to like validate everything, maybe think about what to do with the information. Like, okay, great. Now, you know, uh, I don't need to have this piece of reasoning validate what I'm thinking, but okay, now this piece of reasoning is out there. What can I actually do with it? And it's easier to do that when you don't feel vulnerable, right? So, so when you feel vulnerable and somebody questions your views, it, I mean, so I, I've, I've been, I've re lived a relatively fortunate life. I've never, you know, been one paycheck away from living on the streets. But if I did, you know, maybe crazy conspiracy theories would be harder for me to, to shake because I might feel like I need those theories to feel good about myself. Mm. Um, so it, I, I don't want to point fingers at anybody, but if we can all help each other feel safe enough 
to question our beliefs, then we can actually begin the hard work of, of uh, bouncing the bad ideas and, and becoming wiser, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think people tend to be pretty led by emotions and short-term gratification. As you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of dispossessed people out there right now who may be gravitating towards conspiracy thinking because it gives them that sense of community or centricity or a uh, sense of purpose. Um, but I think what you said a couple beats back about the fact that learning how to reason is, is bedrock to everything else in your life cycling up. So critical thinking might not be for some people at the top of their hierarchy of values, just given other things they may be dealing with. But uh, I think you gave a pretty good pitch there on critical thinking and rationalism and reason, because without it, uh, it's hard to get other domains of your life you know, fired up. Thank, thank you. I, I, I do believe that. And I'm a huge fan of critical thinking, but a little bit leery of the concept. So I think for a long time, we've been trying to encourage people to, to um, test their ideas by saying, come on, guys, think critically. Yeah. The problem with that way of talking about it is that it suggests that we all just need to be more indiscriminately skeptical or mm. that we all just need to be more critical of one another. And, and obviously that's not the right, the, the formula. Think, think about the conspiracy theorist who's thought through, who jumps on everything you say, who's hypercritical of everything. Think of the flat earther, <laughs> who basically who jumps down your throat every time you say something. That person's being hypercritical, but mm. it's not serving him well, mm. right? You can be too critical for your own good. So I actually think that the even though I'm a big fan of critical thinking generally, I think we need to replace the language of critical thinking with the language of mental immunity because it actually offers a much more useful framework for thinking about how to spot and remove bad ideas. Mm. So can we boil that down a little bit more to the elementary level? Like how can this be taught in schools right now? And, you know, I'm talking about, you know, like a fifth grader, can a fifth grader go through an exercise right now where they're learning more effective ways to not, you know, to have better mental immunity? Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's a, a movement called Philosophy for Children, and it's, you know, it's still a kind of a fringe thing in the sense that, you know, not many schools can feel like they can devote entire classes to right. allowing fifth graders to explore philosophical questions. Right. But I think teachers in at any discipline can bring their students together and have deep conversations. Um, you can have deep conversations about the, about the structure of the universe. You can have deep conversations about um, language and how it, how it makes it both easier and harder to connect with one another. I mean, in an English class, you can... If you're an English teacher, you can facilitate a deep conversation about communication and how communication works. And, and a fifth grade, fifth graders love this kind of thing. If mm. you know how to raise the questions and get them all kind of listening to one another and say, hey, hey, little Jimmy, what, what do you think of Susie's idea that, um, that equal shares for everyone is always fair? Well, but I worked harder than little Susie did. So why should she get the equal share? I mean, fifth graders love having these conversations. And when they do them and when they learn to listen to one another, they start to refine their own concepts about justice, their own concepts about how the world works. I wish that science wasn't taught from textbooks. I wish that science was taught in this exploratory way where you're invited to invent your own hypothesis and then come up with a way to test it or mm. you know, get together. Hey, Susie, Johnny, get together and figure out a way. If you can, how can you test Johnny's view that Susie's view that a, that an equal share for everyone is, is fair, but let, let's test that theory. Mm. You know, 10 minutes later, Susie and Johnny come back and say, well, you know, and they have a, a, a case to test it with. Right. Yeah. What about the case where, you know, I work three times as hard and, on, and, and still get the same share? That, does, that can't be right, right? Mm -hmm. Those conversations are, are how we really grow and develop our, our moral toolkit. And I think we can, we, kids should be able to have those kind of conversations every day. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it forces them to come up with an affirmative thesis to your point about critical thinking, instead of just being given a thesis that they can tear down when they arrive at, arrive at it on their own. You know, they have a sense of claim to it, which allows them to think more affirmatively instead of just more cynically. Yeah, nicely, nicely put. And, and actually, it's, I think maybe you're onto something here, Jay, about it's really easy to fault find. But when you actually try to put, to, to come up with an alternative or come up with a solution, you find it's harder. A lot of times it's harder than you imagine. And when you do that and are humbled in the process, you tend to take a kinder view towards other people who hazard their opinions. You know, hey, at least they're out there trying to give, put words around a, a possible solution. Right? So right. don't jump down their throat. Thank them for, for floating a good hypothesis. Maybe help them understand why the hypothesis doesn't quite work, but then help them refine it and, and express it even in an even better way so that we can problem solve together. Amen. Well, do you think that's because some people struggle with what to do with new information? Like they don't understand how it fits in their worldview or how it fits in the view of the other person. Like some people just keep gathering information, but don't actually know how to integrate it or don't know how to apply that new piece of information while getting rid of something else. I, I love that suggestion. That makes sense. So, so if you, if you just take an information and dump it into a pile in your, in your mind, your mind's going to end up just being a steaming pile of, of yeah. information, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, that, so, I mean, a big part of learning is assembling the pieces of knowledge into something coherent and examining your own views to see if they really fit with one another, to see if they really explain things that need explaining, to see if there are, um, if there are aspects of it that uh, aren't serving us well? If, are, they, are they really useful beliefs or, or are they actually counterproductive in one way? These are all tests that, I mean, philosophers have always been concerned to try to assemble the core elements of a, of a coherent and useful and true outlook and to make sure that the pieces of those aren't you know, nullifying one another. Mm -hmm. philosophers like to do consistency checks. Yeah, well, we have this ideas about justice, but we have these other ideas about justice and how do we reconcile those? And then you start asking the really hard questions, right? Um, so, so I like to say that learning, don't imagine that learning is just additive, just a matter of adding information to the stockpile. It's also a matter of weeding out the bad stuff, subtractive learning, and then organizing and creating coherence among what remains. Um, mm. All three elements are important aspects of learning. And, and until you become a master of all three, you know, your odds of, of coming up with a worldview that's, that's actually worth going to culture war for are very, very small or <laughs> negligible. <laughs> yeah. that, that makes sense. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of the idea that all ideas or a lot of ideas are interconnected. So when you're having, when you're dialoguing with someone, you may think you're talking about, you know, one specific idea, but that one idea doesn't just exist in a vacuum for them. It may be connected to 10, 20, 50 other ideas that collectively make up their worldview. So I think, I don't know exactly how you, how you work with that, but I think it all starts with us operating from a point of humility because we may be, th think we're right about this one thing, but um, we may be holding on to the belief that it's right because it's connected to the, all these other things that were we to lose, our whole worldview would become undone. And that's a scary, that's a scary proposition. That, that's a really nice way to put it. I, I like that a lot. Um, yeah. What, and and when, you, when you explore philosophical questions with friends, you start to see how interconnected these ideas are. And you start to realize that if you, that if you adjust some beliefs, other beliefs have to adjust with them. And, but you can also, but you also tend to get the sense that, you know what, the process of rethinking those is not actually a scary or a threatening process. It's actually a really fun and exciting process if you bring the right frame of mind to it. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, when you have those conversations regularly, you tend to realize how much you 
still have to learn <laughs> and the humility comes comes naturally absolutely that, that kind of reminds me jay of this idea that um you know we attached everything and we we have an identity to our thoughts and andy in your book you talk about the identity protective cognition and the mattering instinct can you dive into both of those because those are pretty underappreciated in terms of like human behavior yeah, thanks. So I think the idea that human beings uh, are kind of tribal animals and that are, even our thinking is highly tribal is now, uh, you know, fairly, fairly well understood. But a psychologist at Yale named Dan Cahan has actually come up with a really useful concept. He calls it identity protective cognition. And the idea is that, you know, we, each of us needs to feel, needs to come up with a sense of who we are. And a lot of times we define our identities in terms of the groups we belong to. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I'm an atheist, whatever it is. Um, but when you start to hitch your identity to a set of beliefs that your group shares, then when people come along and question those beliefs, you start to feel threatened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you'll attack the messenger. <laughs> Or, or, or attack the message, even if, even though you might learn from it. Mm. Um, in, in terms of the mind's immune system, the mind's immune system can overreact to information it views as threatening. You, you've, prob you've probably heard that the body's immune system can overreact to, yeah. to a perceived yep. threat, right? Yep. Um, so when you have an allergy attack, that's your body overreacting to something that's essentially harmless. Mm. So the pollen that gives you a hay fever doesn't actually hurt your body, but your body's immune system imagines that it's a huge threat and then generates an overreaction that that, that that's what makes you miserable. Mm -hmm. Our minds can do the same thing. You know, somebody comes along and questions that uh, the core tenets of your conservatism, say, and you just... And your mind goes from zero to 60 in no time and immediately starts to come up, generate reasons or doubts to reject the challenge. Yeah. Right. But when that happens, your, your mind's immune system is not serving you well. It's actually shooting down information that could genuinely make you a more knowledgeable and wiser person. Um, so, so just as a, ment a mind's immune system can be underactive and fail to challenge bad ideas, they can be overactive and actually attack good ideas or attack good information. Mm. Um, so mental immune health involves uh, balance and a kind of balance that we seem to be losing in our time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've heard you mention this before. It might've been in the book or one of the videos I saw you in online, but it's kind of about striking the right balance between being suspicious of a new idea and trusting a new idea. Uh, it's a pretty fine line to, to thread. That's right. You can be too too suspicious for your own good, uh, like the, the, the flat earther who who jumps on everything you say, right? Is is being too jealously suspicious of the things you say, mm -hmm. but he's also, of course, being too credulous about the, the claims of his fellow flat earthers. Right. So, so it's not as if there's a single uh, setting between too too suspicious and too trusting. It the the setting has to adjust from situation to situation ah right so, so when i when i go to my job at the nuclear plant and i have to evaluate the evidence of a possible meltdown you know i need to to use really tough i need to use really rigorous standards to make sure my reasoning is correct and then when i go out for a beer with my buddies afterwards and we're arguing about the best halfback in the in the nfl you know <laughs> go ahead and lower your standards and, <laughs> And let her let her rip, right? Great point. I, I know that you uh, mentioned earlier in the conversation that social media could be doing more to steer people towards good ideas, you know, factual ideas, rational ideas. We've, I think, seen social media in the headlines a lot, especially this past six months. Everyone is trying to figure out what we're going to do with this behemoth we've created. What sort of practical ideas would you like to introduce to the conversation that could get us to a better outcome with social media, Andy? Yeah. So I've been talking to a guy who used to work for Google 
and he is now with a I think a, I think it's a nonprofit called the Junto Foundation, and they're actually trying to redesign social media so that it brings out the best in human nature instead of sort of consistently bringing out the worst. Um, I think it's it's a it's a really tough problem, but also a really really important one. Um, I mean, think about the way in which certain online forums just tend to create flame wars. Oh yeah. Right, They're, the lack of design there, or the, is actually consistently making people angry and bitter and turning people against one another. But we could, you can actually build online environments where people feel a sense of community and a sense of common ownership for the, for building understanding together. How do you do that with just design? I, I don't know that the designers of social media platforms can solve this problem all on their own. I think they've got a piece of the problem in their hands. And we certainly need, you know, the Jack Dorsey's and the Mark Zuckerberg's of the world to do something about wildly irresponsible abuse of their platforms. Mm. Um, I, I think that we need to let go of a kind of free speech fundamentalism that basically says everybody has a right to say whatever they darn please. Um, the fact is there are many, many noxious ideas. I can't yell fire in a crowded theater. I can't push white supremacist nonsense without harming others. And there are many, many ideas that where our responsibilities override our supposed speech rights. And it's time we woke up to that and built an, uh, a digital world, an online world where we take our responsibilities as seriously as we take our rights. Yeah, there's, you know, every commercial that advertises for Budweiser will tell you to drink responsibly. It's time to believe responsibly. Yeah, nice. You know, mm -hmm. it's, um, mm -hmm. because it's from your book where I was thinking like, okay, you're so right. Like we need to get rid of the community of belief and more like be more associated in a community of inquiry. Mm -hmm. And that just seems so easy mm -hmm. on paper. But as we're thinking about it and talking about it right now, like it's going to take these types of grassroots conversations um, with everyone. Like people really need to feel responsible for their belief. Like if you don't believe that you need to go get the vaccine, like that's your belief ha carries weight. I mean, you should be responsible for that because it affects other people. So, I mean, that shift in perspective in this environment is probably the hardest thing that we're going to face. But I think this conversation helps with that. And if we can help people understand like, okay, um, a good idea means that, you know, it can withstand challenges. Uh, a belief is reasonable if, you know, it can also withstand some challenges. So you just have to know what's a good idea and what's a, what's a reasonable belief. And, and, and almost every one of our beliefs has implications for the well-being of others, right? So we tend to imagine that our beliefs are our own business. Um, yeah. My beliefs are mine. Get your Get your reasons off of my beliefs. Uh, and we, we feel very entitled to the contents of our minds. But that, that sense of entitlement is turning us into spoiled, into like spoiled children. Um, <laughs> that, that, that if, if you just feel entitled to believe or say whatever you want, you're not going to become a responsible thinker. Um, and, and realizing how interconnected we are now and how our beliefs affect the well-being of others, and certainly when we express them, but also when we act on them. That means we have a responsibility to believe things that don't just serve ourselves well, but ideas that at, at the very least don't harm others, mm. right? I, I came across a cartoon this morning on Facebook where you, you know a, a ship is like the Titanic is, is half submerged. And a guy says, uh, you know, I, I dug down through the floorboards of my stateroom uh, and the water came pouring in, but it's my stateroom. I, I should have a right to, to do that, right? We're all in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. And, and I guess the one, one question I have for you to kind of clarify your thinking, would you have been a free speech fundamentalist prior to or more of a free speech fundamentalist prior to the digital age or do you think that that was the kind of catalyst that changed everything and changed the way we need to think about responsibly handling our beliefs that's a really good question um so 
as as a I, I identify as a free thinker, but only loosely because uh, for the most part, I, I I try to hold all my labels loose, so I don't become identity protective about yeah. that, right? Yeah. But yeah. but 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 free thinkers are generally committed to inquiry, and if inquiry compels us to rethink the core tenets of our worldviews, mm. we go great, bring it on. <laughs> I love testing my core ideas. Come on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so God, sorry, back, back me up a step where, where remind me of the think, question. Yeah. Do you think the, the digital age, uh, transformed the way that we need to think about free speech? Yeah. It's, so I guess what I wanted to say was that free thinkers going way back have been big fans of freedom of speech. And I, th- I think for good reason, because the major threat to our collective well-being used to be kind of tyranny or dictatorship, centralized authority um, that that cracks down on speech. That was the major threat to a collective well-being. And in an wor- environment like that, emphasizing our speech rights made a lot of sense. And so I have a very, I think, healthy respect for the First Amendment, say, which guarantees the right to free speech. And it's also true that all rights are bounded by responsibilities, right? When when a Supreme Court justice said, you're not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater, he was saying that, sure, we have speech rights, but that doesn't mean you can say whatever you want if if it might harm others. If you start looking at all of the ways we can harm Mm -hmm. others by spewing conspiracy thinking online or by spewing political propaganda online, your own commitment to what I call free speech fundamentalism will likely waver and should waver. Um, yes, it's possible to be to crack down on speech rights in ways that are genuinely problematic and worrisome, and it's also possible to be so laissez-faire about everybody getting to say whatever they darn please that mind viruses just sweep through populations and and trigger um, genocides. I mean, it, Facebook. Facebook has already been weaponized twice to to trigger a genocide. It happened in Sri Lanka and it happened in uh, Malaysia. I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. Yeah. Um, and it could happen here. One of the points of the concept of rights, a right is supposed to identify something as more or less sacred, meaning you're not supposed to do anything to interfere with that freedom. Mm. But the not supposed to do anything is so general, so global, so indiscriminate that it tends to run roughshod over exceptions. Mm. So when you actually study the way the concept of rights works, it often, it it can become, think about the way in which um, a property rights, somebody who's developed a fundamentalist attitude toward property rights. Suppose you buy the property next door to a a complete free marketeer and erect a 50 foot neon billboard on your property. And he said, hey, you can't do that here. There are zoning restrictions. And you say, it's my property. I can do whatever I want. Mm. All of a sudden this free, this libertarian free marketeer is suddenly gonna realize, you know, maybe my absolute stance on property rights needs modification. Mm. That same thing should be true with speech rights. So as a professor, what are your thoughts right now on what's going on with woke culture and the idea that everyone is looking to hold on or attach themselves to an identity? So we want to have this conversation where people should have more open-mindedness, but we're also living in an era of cancel culture and the woke culture. And to me, that's conflicting. Like you, you can't make much progress. It's like this. Okay. So it worked for you know, the premise of it was great. It worked. It brought awareness to certain things. But the way I think about it, it's like portfolio diversification. After your 20th stock in a portfolio, like that 21st stock that you're going to add could actually be more risky than it does add diversification. So my point is that the more categories that we create, the more woke we try to be, at some point, there's a point of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of conflicting views about sort of woke culture. Um, 
on the one hand, I think a lot of it is well-intentioned. I think there's a whole lot of injustice in this world and social justice warriors are often mean well when they try to take it on. Um, But I also think there's a real danger when we valorize identities to the exclusion of valorizing our commonalities. Um, I mean, and some of the tactics of of the cancel culture warriors are, I think, deplorable. Um, I myself have been the target of people who just had no interest in really understanding what I wanted to say, but just assumed they understood what I was saying and (laughs) tried to dox me online, right? I mean, a lot lot of people have been there, right? Yeah. Um, in the same way that a religious conservative can become really self-righteous and, and close-minded, uh, a social justice warrior from on the left can become deeply close-minded. And, and basically, it's something like an orthodoxy is forming around, I don't know, identity politics or something. And it's, it's not a healthy thing. And it's destructive of the kind of dialogue that allows us to thrive together. I think there's ex- there are extremes on both the right and the left right now that are endangering the the kind of dialogue that I think is the the real secret to thriving together. Um, so, mm-hmm. I, I I really worry about to, to me the kind of orthodoxy and canceling that's coming from culture warriors on the right is the bigger threat. But I may be missing something, there's certainly a threat from the, from the extreme woke left as well. Mm. Yeah. Socrates may have been one of the first people they had canceled. Uh, so. <laughs> Here, drink some hemlock. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's exactly. a way to cancel somebody. <laughs> Pretty extreme form. Yeah. So I, one question I wanted to ask you too, you know, you could imagine a world where if let's say the far right were to have control of platforms what they would deem good or bad or, you know, worthy of, of being disseminated, that could cause tremendous problems for us if they were responsible for running that filter. At the same time, if, you know, the far left were in the driver's seat, you could imagine the same thing. So how do we avoid creating a thought police that is subject to the, you know, the political sentiment of the time and actually create filters for the kinds of ideas that are being spread that will hold the test of time that are truly objective, truly rational, truly grounded in first principles, rather than the whims of whoever are creating that, those, those filters. Uh, You ask great questions and and tough ones too. That's a, that's a really tough question that I take up in my chapter seven. So, So here's the basic structure of the problem. I think Um, we can't just, Once you realize that it's not okay to just believe whatever you want, then the question becomes, well, how do do we regulate our own beliefs properly? And so the whole idea that we, the whole idea that we should regulate belief at all immediately triggers fears of thought police Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the part of many. But there are different ways to, I mean, an authoritarian government can regulate speech but when a community of scientists comes together and test each other's ideas, they're regulating belief too, but in a very different way. Mm. There are distributed, decentralized, dialogue-based ways of regulating belief mm. that are hugely preferable to top-down authoritarian modes of regulating belief. Mm. And I'm firmly of the belief that no one of us should be able to Impo- decide for everyone which ideas are good and which ideas are bad. We need to have a, build a big community of inquiry where everybody's voice um, matters, mm. and and where the the interplay of those voices in a constructive dialogue systematically weeds out the worst ideas. Not because so and so said so, but because together we have shown that it's an idea that must be discarded. Yeah, kind of like a peer review at scale. Yeah, and and it's, I mean, science has done this at scale, right? It's one of the most marvelous accomplishments of of humankind. And 
science is an imperfect process. I mean, just watching the CDC's recommendation change as the COVID <laughs> pandemic <Yeah>. has unfolded <laughs> shows how imperfect science can be. Um, but it's sure a hell of a lot better than dogmatic orthodoxies. And we need to, can't forget that. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, no, this has been a great conversation. Andy, I think it's safe to say uh, that your work has been discovered, at least by the two of us. Um, I know it's been so cool that, you know, to have this conversation with you, I really feel like it's a game changer type of conversation where we can look back on this in maybe three or five years and just be like, you know, we were at the cusp and uh, we either went one way or we actually made a change. And it's really on us. Like we have the ability as humans to uh, at least assess the situation that we're in and make the wiser choice. Um, at least I believe that we have that capability. And I think that like, if we all do our part, then we can actually make some really tremendous strides. That's music to my ears, Arjun. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you guys seem to really get it in ways that not all the people I, I, I talk to do. So I, I, you can consider your guys, uh, you should consider yourselves uh, ahead of the curve here, because I think you're, and, and thank you for very much for helping me uh, share these ideas with your listeners. Very happy. No worries. Before we let you go, though, one final question. Um, if you could be an animal, any animal, which animal would you be and why? Oh, man. Okay. Well, I've been saying for a while that uh, owls are my spirit animal, being as okay. a philosopher, right? You just look at an owl and you say, man, look, look how attentive how wide-eyed, how observant an owl is. I, I, I want to be more owl-like. So mm. uh, I don't take talk of spirit animals seriously. My tongue is firmly planted in my cheek when I say that. <laughs> but I'm very fond of owls. Uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a dolphin trainer. I, 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 I find dolphins fascinating. But uh, I, think, I, I think you uh, invited me to share one. So I, I'm already over my limit. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Because think about an owl, you know, they have like 50, 60 million years of like evolutionary wisdom. I, I, I agree with you. When you look at an owl, there's an aura to it. That Yeah, that's I think that's what I'm trying to. I saw a picture of a, one of those white snowy owls with big, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. big eyes. And just I, I, I actually think that I've, I've had students who took my class and said, you know, the philosophy was great, Professor Norman, but you really taught me how to listen. And he, mm -hmm. and he said that conversations in your class are so eye-opening because you're such a good listener and you, you exemplify, like every time a student tries to say, make a point and doesn't say it terribly well, I'll help them say it better. And then we'll mm -hmm. consider its pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. So I make a habit of that when in my teaching. And I, I was very fortunate to take a class on listening at Syracuse University back in the day. And I feel like I ended up a slightly more owl-like mm. <laughs> from <laughs> having taken that class. And it certainly helped my teaching. <laughs> That's awesome. Wonderful. I actually had a dream about an owl last night. So maybe you were visiting me in my sleep. Maybe it was some kind of premonition. <laughs> sure. sure, let's go with that idea. <laughs> Not, nothing wrong with that idea. <laughs> I love it. Well, again, the book is called Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and the Search for a Better Way to Think. Nice. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Andy. If you enjoyed this episode, you can sign up for the Rising Weekly newsletter sent out each week. Every Friday, we expand on the episode with insights, recommendations, and more. You can sign up at risingladderly.com. Thank you.